Christians have been celebrating Lent in some form or another since the origins of the church. And this Lenten season of fasting and prayer has always somehow been connected with the holiest days in the liturgical cycle. The three-day Paschal celebration starting on the evening of Holy Thursday, going into Good Friday and finishing with Easter Sunday. And the center of that celebration is the cross. In carrying the cross, Jesus takes upon himself all the sins of the world. In obediently and lovingly dying on the cross, he atones for those sins. And in rising again from the dead, he turns the sign of the cross into the banner of his everlasting victory over evil. The cross was absolutely central to the life and mission of Jesus Christ. And so it must also be absolutely central to the life and mission of us Christians. Why did God make the cross so central to the life of his son? Why does he make the cross so central to our lives? And how can we learn to carry our crosses as courageously and as fruitfully as Christ carried his? These are the questions that this retreat guide, The Colors of the Cross, will invite you to reflect on, to meditate on, and to pray about. In the first meditation starter, we'll tackle the first question. Why did God make the cross so central to our faith? And we'll seek an answer in the first color of the cross, the brown earth color of the wood itself. In the second meditation starter, we'll tackle the second question. Why does God make the cross so central in our lives? And we'll seek our answer in the second color of the cross, the red color of Christ's life-giving blood. And in the conference, we'll take a look at the third color of the cross, the simple skin color of Christ's complete humanity which will help us get practical and give us a chance to explain the age-old Catholic exercise of uniting our sufferings to Christ's sufferings by offering them up. Before you dive in, take a few moments to turn the eyes of your heart towards God. And thank Him for this chance to spend some time with Him in quiet prayer and ask Him for all the graces that you need and in a special way for the grace to penetrate a little bit more deeply, the glorious mystery of the cross of Jesus Christ. God, all-powerful and all-wise, could have chosen an infinite number of ways to redeem the fallen human race. And from all these possibilities, he chose the incarnation, passion, death, and resurrection of the second person of the Blessed Trinity. Because of this, we know for certain that the cross was not a mistake. All of the events and prophecies of the Old Testament were pointing towards the cross. And Jesus himself explained how the cross was the necessary centerpiece of his redeeming mission. Talking to his 12 apostles, he explained that the Son of Man must suffer greatly and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the scribes, and be killed, and on the third day be raised. And later, as the fateful day of the crucifixion was drawing near and Jesus was beginning to feel the pressure, he made the same point again when he said, I am troubled now, yet what should I say? Father, save me from this hour, but it was for this purpose that I came to this hour. There's simply no doubt about it. The cross was absolutely central to the life and mission of Jesus Christ. But why? The answer to that question is vast and mysterious and inexhaustible. But we know for certain at least one of the reasons. To understand that reason, we have to go back to the beginning. God's original plan for the human family was spoiled by original sin. Through original sin, our first parents rebelled against God and separated themselves from his friendship. That brought evil, death, and suffering into the world. At the root of that sinful and destructive rebellion was an act of arrogance, of diabolical pride, by which Adam and Eve tried to take over the place of God. Here's how the Catechism describes it. In that sin, man preferred himself to God, and by that very act, scorned him. He chose himself over and against God, against the requirements of his creaturely status, and therefore against his own good. After original sin, God had a choice to make, so to speak. He could either abandon the human rebels and let them suffer the full consequences of their sinful actions, or he could save and redeem them. He chose the second option. He sent us a Savior and a Redeemer, Jesus Christ. And Jesus, in order to repair the destruction caused by original sin, 
reversed that act of diabolical pride by committing an act of heroic humility. Instead of elevating himself, as Adam and Eve tried to do, he humbled himself. Here's how St. Paul puts it. Have among yourselves the same attitude that is also yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God something to be grasped. Rather, he emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, coming in human likeness. And found human in appearance, he humbled himself, becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. By being obedient to the extreme of absolute humility, Jesus untied the knot of original sin. He rebuilt the bridge of communion between God and the human family, between heaven and earth. And that's why the first color of the cross is the brown earth color of the wood itself. The word humility comes from the Latin root word humus, which means earth or soil. The same Latin term is at the root of our word for humanity. An act of humility always involves keeping ourselves in our place as created human beings, as earthly. That's just the opposite of sin, which follows the example of the builders of the Tower of Babel, who tried to force their way into the divine realm, leaving their earthly origins behind and transforming themselves into gods. And the color of the earth, of the soil, is brown, the same as the color of the cross. The cross is the stage of the greatest act of humility in human history, which repaired for the monstrous act of pride at the dawn of that history. The cross was central for Christ's mission because Jesus came to atone for all sin, and only an act of absolute humility could do that. And only Jesus, true God and true man, could make an act of absolute humility. For the rest of us, humility, being earthly, dependent, close to the hummus, is our natural state. It's what we're supposed to be. Pride and arrogance are the aberrations. But Jesus Christ is the divine word become man. He deserved to be revered and worshiped and elevated. And yet, for our sake, to redeem us from sin, to fix what we had broken and couldn't fix ourselves, he chose to be scorned, rejected, and humiliated to the extreme. If Jesus hadn't have humbled himself, then we would have no hope of recovering the abundant eternal life that we forfeited with original sin and that we long for in the depths of our hearts. Humility is the soil from which true spiritual happiness springs, just as hummus is the soil from which all earthly plants grow. Picture a high mountain, a snow-covered mountain, where would you rather live, on the peak of that towering mountain or in the valley at its foot? The peak is far away, magnificent, impressive, but there is no life there. Only snow, rocks, and cold wind. Nothing can grow in those harsh conditions. The valley is closer, less visible, less impressive from a distance, but it is teeming with life. The sun melts the snow on the peak and the waters flow down the mountain and irrigate the valley, giving it glorious life. Pride is like the peak of that mountain, and humility is like the valley. Jesus, by humbling himself and accepting death on a cross, melted the pride of our fallen human family and renewed the flow of grace in our hearts, giving us new life, new hope, new strength. When we look at the crucifix, is that what we see? When we look at the crucifix, do we allow ourselves to be amazed at God who goes to such extremes to ransom his rebellious sheep? When we look at the crucifix, do our hearts fill with gratitude for such a gift? When we look at the crucifix, are we moved to repent from our self-centeredness and our arrogance and to follow Christ's example of loving humility? Let's take some time now to gaze at Jesus on the cross and to meditate on the first color of the cross, the brown earth color of absolute humility, which opened the door of hope and laid the groundwork for our salvation.
cross was absolutely central to Christ's mission because he reversed the pride of sin with his act of absolute humility. And if it was central for him, it must also be central for his followers, for you and me. Jesus left no room for doubt on this score. St. Luke tells us that Jesus, speaking to all of his followers, not just the 12, said, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Through his own cross, Jesus opened the path of eternal life, and through our crosses, we follow that path. The fathers of the church called the cross the new tree of life, taking the place of the old tree of life in the Garden of Eden that was forfeited by original sin. It's easy to see how we all have crosses. No one is exempt from difficulties and sufferings in this life. But it's not so easy to see how those crosses can increase the life of grace in our souls. How does that work? The answer is found in the second color of the cross, the red of Christ's blood, poured out for us on the cross, staining the wood of the cross, and revealing to us for all time the real motivation behind Jesus' redeeming self-sacrifice, love. Red is the color of blood, and blood is the symbol of life itself. And the meaning of life, as God has revealed it to us in Christ, is love, self-giving, self-sacrificing, self-forgetfulness. Jesus put it like this in the Last Supper. No man has a greater love than to lay down his life for his friends. On the cross, Jesus not only reveals to us the horror of our sins, the fruits of our rebellious pride, but he also reveals the totality of his love. Jesus didn't redeem us because we deserved to be redeemed or because he had to. Jesus redeemed us. He gave himself in atonement for our sins because he loved us. God wanted to reveal the totality of his love. And so he ordained that Jesus must suffer not just a little bit, but immensely, profusely, to the extreme. The intensity of Christ's suffering on the cross is a direct reflection of the intensity of God's unconditional love for us. Unconditional because he didn't wait until we were worthy of such a gift. He poured it out freely. This is what completely amazed St. Paul as he wrote in his letter to the Romans, but God proves his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And if we're ever tempted to doubt that love that God has for us, all we have to do is go to mass or kneel in front of a tabernacle. There, the same gift is still being given. Jesus, while we're still here on earth, while we're still full of selfishness and sin, continues to give himself completely to us in the sacrament of the Eucharist. There is the second color of the cross, flickering quietly but surely in the sanctuary lamp, reminding each one of us that God's love for me is full, total, and without any conditions. In the deep red color of Christ's love, we find the secret to carrying our own crosses. Our fallen nature resists the cross. We just don't like facing difficulties and sufferings, confusion and rejection, disappointment and betrayal. These are our crosses and they hurt. And yet God permits them. Certainly he protects us from, from many sufferings, but not from all of them. Why? Because God knows that in order for us to find the happiness and the meaning that we truly long for, we have to grow in our friendship with him. And every friendship is built on trust. And so to grow in our friendship with God, we have to grow in our trust in God. And the moment in which we can exercise that trust most fully is when obeying or accepting God's will is hard, when we feel the weight of our crosses. This is why God permits crosses in our lives, so that we, as Jesus before us, can say trustingly to God and really mean it, let your will and not mine be done. And where do we find the strength to do that? Only by meditating on the crucifix, because there we discover that Jesus is truly and utterly faithful. His blood-stained cross proves forever that he will never abandon us, 
that he really is worthy of our trust, that no matter what we might do to him and no matter what might happen to us, he will keep on loving us. He will bring resurrections out of our crucifixions just as he did with his own. That's his promise, and it's a promise we can count on. His total love for us, shown so brilliantly in the red-stained wood of the cross, frees us to love him totally by trusting in him even when we're experiencing the pains of our own crucifixions. And that trust is what allows his grace to flow more and more freely in our souls, bringing us the abundant life we were created for. Christ's love revealed to us on the cross enables us to trust God and to love as Jesus loved. The story of St. John Gualbert is a powerful example of this. John was the founder of a monastery outside the city of Florence, Italy in the 11th century, a monastery that has been a factory of holiness ever since. But John didn't start out as a saint. He was a young nobleman who thoroughly enjoyed all his aristocratic privileges. Besides pleasure, his main passion was revenge. His brother Hugh had been murdered, and John felt it was his duty to put the killer to death. Not a very Christ-like ambition. For a long time, he searched for the culprit, becoming angrier the longer he searched. One good Friday, as he was returning to Florence from a short journey, he was making his way through a narrow pass in the road when his prey entered the same pass from the other side. There was no escape. John drew his sword and prepared to avenge his brother's death. But the killer cast himself on his knees, spread his arms out in the form of a cross, and begged for mercy. At that moment, his sword poised over his enemy's neck, the man's posture made him think of Christ, hanging on the cross and loving his enemies. He couldn't bring himself to carry out his long contemplated plan. Instead, he sheathed his sword, embraced his brother's murderer, and forgave him. After the encounter, he went to the nearest church to pray. He knelt before the crucifix there, and as he prayed, he saw the head of Jesus on the crucifix bow and nod in approval of his deed of mercy. That's when he discovered his vocation and began the adventure of becoming a saint. By pouring out his lifeblood for us on the cross, Jesus shows us his love, and that enables us, as it did St. John Gualbert, to abandon ourselves to that love, to trust him, and to choose his will over our own. Jesus knows that in this fallen world, where so many things are upside down, and where suffering seems to lurk around every corner, it's often very hard for us to trust God, to obey and accept God's will when it hurts. And he knows that we can only do that if we are thoroughly convinced that he is worthy of our trust, that he completely and fully loves us, and that he will never abandon us. And he never will, no matter what. That's the message of the second color of the cross, the red stain of the blood of Christ. Let's take some time now to let the Holy Spirit remind us of this truth, and if necessary, to convince us afresh that God truly is trustworthy, that his will is always connected to his love, a love so total and so personal that Jesus suffered to the extreme to prove it to us.
We've been meditating on the meaning of the cross in salvation. And we've seen that Jesus on the cross reveals to us a couple of things. He shows us, first of all, his act of absolute humility, which reverses the sin of pride and rebellion. And he also shows us the totality of his love. Those are the first two colors of the cross. But now we need to get practical. We need to reflect on how we can carry our crosses as courageously and as fruitfully as Jesus carried his. And for this, we're going to take a look at the third color of the cross, the simple skin color of Christ's complete humanity. Jesus' suffering on the cross was fully human. And so we know that when we suffer in life, we're not alone. Jesus suffered everything that we suffered. He knows what it's like. And so it's just a question of uniting our sufferings to Christ's sufferings by offering them up. It's a question of taking our crosses and kind of plugging them into Christ's cross. This is what offering it up really means. And it's not that complicated. It's just a matter of activating our faith and turning our eyes to Jesus and saying a little prayer of self-surrender. And when we do that, then our crosses become channels for God's grace, which began to flow into the world when Christ was hanging on his cross, to continue flowing and spreading into the world, into our hearts and into the hearts of those around us. That's what offering it up really means. Now the church gives us a powerful and beautiful illustration of this in one of her most magnificent buildings, St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. The basilica was constructed over the tomb of St. Peter, the first pope. And the high altar, the central altar in the basilica, is located directly over that tomb. And soaring above that high altar is a huge dome, which is decorated on the inside by blue and gold mosaics. The dome is 157 meters high, and it was designed by Michelangelo. And they finished construction on the dome in the year 1590. Now those gold and blue mosaics that decorate the inside of the dome are kind of a portrait of heaven. They depict the angels, the prophets, and the patriarchs from the Old Testament, the 12 apostles, the Blessed Virgin Mary, all surrounding Jesus. It's really a glimpse, a snapshot of heaven. This huge dome is architecturally supported by four pillars, huge pillars. And they carved niches in each of those pillars and then sculpted statues of four saints to put inside those niches. There's kind of a theme between these four saints that, that links these four saints. They all participated in some way in the cross of Jesus, in his passion, in his death. Now the fact that these four saints that are kind of built into the pillars, which supports the dome, uh, that they all participated in Christ's cross in some way is not a coincidence. There's actually a theological meaning in this. It's pretty clear, if you think about it. For us to rise to the heights of holiness, to enter into the glory of heavenly light, the light of eternal life, we have to pass through the sufferings of the cross. There's a, a medieval phrase invented by the monks in medieval times that summarizes this theological lesson. Per crucem ad lucem through the cross to the light. And that theological truth is illustrated by the architecture of St. Peter's Basilica. The pillars supporting the dome are all kind of linked to the passion. So to get to heaven, we have to pass through the sufferings of the cross. Now, I want to take a look at each one of those statues, at each one of those saints, one by one, because I think that in contemplating those works of art and the experience of those saints, we will be encouraged and we will be taught how to Offer it up, how to unite our crosses to the crosses of Christ. Now, the first sculpture is that of Saint Helen. Helen was a Roman empress. She was the mother of Constantine, the Roman emperor who legalized Christianity in the year 313, which was a big deal because Christianity had been persecuted by the Roman Empire for about 300 years. Constantine was a good emperor in many ways, and he died as a baptized Christian. But he kind of suffered from some of the same sins that tend to plague powerful and successful men in every era. Jealousy, infidelity, anger, murder, these kind of things. Helen, who was a very holy woman and a dedicated Christian, 
at one point decided that she was going to do penance for some of her son's worst sins. So she made a vow to take a pilgrimage to the Holy Land, to Palestine, to Jerusalem, and to uncover or discover the wood of the true cross, the cross that Jesus actually was crucified on. You see, local traditions had held that on the day of Christ's crucifixion, in, the, in kind of the chaos of the aftermath of the crucifixion with the earthquakes and the rocks and the, and the eclipse of the sun, they had quickly taken down the wood of the cross and they'd thrown it into a ditch and it had become covered, covered over by rocks during, that, during, those, uh, during the earthquake after the crucifixion. So the tradition held that the cross, the wood of the cross was there, but no one had actually been able to find it. So St. Helen went to the Holy Land and she went to find the wood of the true cross. And with the help of St. Macarius, who was the Bishop of Jerusalem at the time, and a miracle or two, she did find it. And when she found it, she venerated it. And she had the whole Christian world venerate it with her. A relic of the true cross used to be kept in the little chapel built into the pillar just above St. Helen's statue. We can learn a key lesson from St. Helen. We don't have to be afraid of our crosses. We should identify them, we should uncover them, we should name them and embrace them and venerate them. Venerate them as an opportunity, a golden opportunity, for us to participate in Christ's cross. Our crosses are kind of a little share in the cross of Christ, which redeemed the human race. This is the lesson we can learn from St. Helen. We don't have to be afraid of our crosses. Actually, we should seek them out, name them, embrace them. Per crucem ad lucem. The second sculpture in the pillars of St. Peter's Basilica is a sculpture of St. Longinus. Longinus was the Roman soldier who took his spear and plunged it into the side of Christ to make sure that he was dead as he was hanging on the cross. St. John in his Gospel tells us that when the spear pierced our Lord's side, immediately there flowed out of his side blood and water. An ancient Christian tradition tells us that that blood and water actually kind of spilled onto the face of St. Longinus and performed a miracle. It cured him of an eye ailment that he had had for a long time and kind of opened the door for him to receive the gift of faith. Longinus's spearhead was preserved by the early Christians. And for a while, it was kept in the little chapel built into the pillar right above the statue of St. Longinus. St. Longinus was close to Jesus as he died on the cross, so close that he could plunge his spear into the heart of our Lord. We should stay close to Jesus when we carry our crosses too. We should be so close to him that his grace can flow over our weaknesses, our wounds, our confusion, our disappointments, all of our crosses, and comfort us and heal us. And we can do this in a special way through the sacraments, the sacraments of the Eucharist and confession. The blood and water that flowed out of Christ's side are a symbol and kind of a prefigurement of the sacraments of the church. The sacraments are gifts of God, ways that he has invented, in a sense, to stay close to us so that we don't have to suffer alone, so that we can receive comfort and strength and kind of bathe all of our own sufferings in the love of God. Jesus wanted his heart to be pierced so that we would know that he is always open to us and waiting longingly for us to take shelter in his wounded heart. It's no coincidence that Jesus chose to remain with us in the Eucharist under the appearance of bread. Bread is a source of strength for our bodies, and Jesus wants to be a source of strength for our souls. We need to let him do that. Per crucem ad lucem. The third statue in the pillars of St. Peter's Basilica is the statue of St. Andrew, St. Peter's brother. After spreading the Christian faith in northern Greece and in southeastern Europe, Andrew died a martyr's death by being crucified on a cross that was made in the shape of an X. They used to keep some of his relics in the chapel built into the pillar right above the statue of St. Andrew. St. Andrew fled from the cross 
on Good Friday when our Lord was crucified. He was weak. He was afraid. And like the other apostles, he watched the crucifixion from a distance. But after the victory of the resurrection, and after receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit, his love was strengthened to the point where he was faithful to our Lord up to giving his own life in martyrdom. And the interesting thing about this statue is where St. Andrew puts his attention. Even as he wraps his arms around his cross, his eyes are gazing upward. He's seeing Christ, either in a vision or in prayer. See, he knows that Jesus died on the cross first, that Jesus suffered the hideous death that he's going to suffer in just a minute. And so he knows that he will not be alone as he hangs and dies on his cross. Jesus was there first. Everything that he's going to suffer, Jesus already suffered. And so he looks at Jesus to remind himself of that so he doesn't have to be alone as he dies on his cross. And all of that gave him hope, confidence, and peace. And it can do the same for us. No matter what form our suffering takes, Jesus has suffered the same thing. We are not alone. All we have to do is lift our gaze to our Lord and we have someone who suffers with us and who gives us strength. Maybe our suffering is physical suffering. <laughs> Jesus experienced that on the cross to the extreme. Maybe we're experiencing loneliness or criticism or rejection or betrayal. Jesus suffered the same on the cross. Maybe we're feeling frustration, disappointment, confusion, sorrow. Jesus felt the same. Maybe we're suffering because someone we love is suffering. Mary had that experience too, as she stood at the foot of the cross and watched her son's life ebb away. As we feel the weight of our crosses, as we wrap our arms around our crosses, we should keep in mind that Jesus knows what we're going through, that he's close to us, that he's not a distant, abstract God. And like St. Andrew, we should turn our gaze to him, and offer up our sufferings in union with his. Per crucem ad lucem. As the letter to the Hebrews puts it, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us rid ourselves of every burden and sin that clings to us and persevere in running the race that lies before us while keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus, the leader and perfecter of faith. For the sake of the joy that lay before him, he endured the cross, despising its shame, and has taken his seat at the right of the throne of God. The fourth statue built into the pillars of St. Peter's Basilica is a statue of St. Veronica. An ancient Christian tradition holds that Veronica was a Christian disciple who comforted our Lord as he carried his cross on the way to Calvary. She used her veil to wipe away the sweat and the grime and the dirt from our Lord's holy face. And Jesus comforted her in turn by leaving an image of that holy face on that veil. Veronica's veil used to be kept in the chapel built into the pillar right above her statue. This incident is very revealing. It shows that Jesus wasn't a lone ranger and that his kingdom is not made up of lone rangers. Jesus allowed himself to be comforted by the courageous love of a fellow human being, and he comforted her in return. Likewise, as we know from scripture, Jesus actually allowed himself to be helped as he carried his cross by Saint Simon of Cyrene. In Christ's kingdom, we're meant to lean on each other, to assist each other. We're not meant to be isolated, we're meant to be connected. And we can comfort each other directly simply by helping other people carry their crosses and by letting others help, help us carry our crosses. And we can also comfort each other spiritually by offering up the sacrifice of our crosses for the good of other members in the church. Just as Jesus offered himself as a sacrifice and thereby won graces for us as he died on the cross, so we can offer our sacrifices to God and bring down graces for the church for those in need. Now this is possible because we are mystically united to Jesus through our baptism, through grace. Therefore, our sacrifices can share in the redemptive value of his. 
This opens up a whole new dimension in the meaning of our sufferings. Per crucem ad lucem. Here's how St. Paul puts it in his letter to the Colossians. Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am filling up what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ on behalf of his body, which is the church. This is what St. Veronica teaches us, to offer up our sacrifices for the good of the mystical body of Christ, to stay connected, to comfort others, and to allow others to comfort us. Jesus was fully human. He suffered in the same way that we suffered. We don't have to suffer alone. We can unite our crosses to his. This is the meaning of the third color of the cross, the simple skin color of Christ's complete humanity. By suffering in all the ways that we suffer, he opened up the possibility of us turning our crosses into pathways to divine light, into channels of divine grace through Christ, with Christ, and in Christ, as we say in the Mass, our crosses can build up Christ's kingdom of humility, love, and trust in our hearts and in the hearts of everyone around us. All we have to do is identify our crosses, face them, name them, and embrace them like St. Helen. Stay close to Jesus through the sacraments when we're carrying our crosses like St. Longinus. Keep our eyes fixed on Jesus like St. Andrew, and like St. Veronica, comfort others in their crosses and allow others to comfort us in ours. This is how we can offer up our sufferings in union with Christ's for the advance of his kingdom. Offering it up is a simple thing, really, even though it isn't a crystal clear mathematical formula. It just means fertilizing our crosses with faith and prayer so that they can become the tree of life that God wants them to become. Take a few minutes now and reflect on how you carry your crosses and how, with God's help, you might be able to carry them better. Take a look at the questionnaire. The 10 questions may help you in this reflection. They're not a test. They're just meant to aid your reflection and your prayer.